All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Carl, and this is Evan. And uh, I hope you're all here for the BigQuery nested and repeated fields. Dig deeper into data. Sounds like a very long title for the end of the long day. So we'll do our best to keep you guys energized, and we have a wonderful presentation prepared for you. Uh, just a couple of words about ourselves. My name is Carl Osipov. I'm a staff program manager at Google Cloud. And I help Google Cloud customers and partners succeed with our offering by getting trained and certified. And Evan? I'm Evan Jones. I've been uh, teaching SQL for going on 10, 15 years. And honestly, using BigQuery is an absolute blast. And hopefully, you'll see through some of the demos here today. Uh, and if you'd like to learn more, there's a lot of Coursera courses that we do a lot of. I'm on a training and curriculum team that we have as well. So if you're not sick of seeing my mug after today, you're welcome to watch eight hours of me teach uh, BigQuery ML on Coursera. All right, awesome. And if you need to find out more about us, just feel free to reach out. Our emails are really simple, first name, last name, at google.com. So uh, here's what this session is about. And really, I want to make this session about all of you. So I have some questions for you to start with. Uh, first of all, if you are currently analyzing data that's maybe stored in formats like JSON, uh, JavaScript object notation, or XML, could you please just uh, Throw your hand up if you're analyzing this type of data. Very good. So maybe about half of you. And please keep holding your hand. So for those of you who are holding your hand up, um, how many of you are analyzing that data using SQL? All right. So we're down to maybe about a uh, third. And how many of you are analyzing that data using SQL on BigQuery? All right, so now we're down to about a fifth. So I think for vast majority of you, a lot of the content here in this presentation is going to be really interesting. So I'll explain this concept of semi-structured data that might be new to many of you. And then I'll help you grow your SQL skills to help you understand how to use features of SQL 2011, like arrays and structured type, to analyze semi-structured data. So I think most of you have seen BigQuery by now, so I'm not going to go too deep into BigQuery, but I'll give a brief refresher on, uh, on this offering from Google Cloud. And then I'll show you how BigQuery can help you tap into this semi-structured data, which is extremely important. And uh, we're going to have a lot of demos. Actually, we'll have a lot of live coding in this session. So don't expect this to be a sales pitch. This is going to be a lot, of, uh, a lot of fun examples you can take away from this session and use uh, on your own projects. And ultimately, I know it's the end of the day, so we want to keep you guys energized and hopefully come up with some really good questions for us. So uh, my question for you. Have, are there anybody here in the audience who are analyzing petabytes of data today? Could I just see a show of hands? Oh, I think we have uh, single digits. And at a first glance, right, petabyte of data, that may sound absurdly large. In fact, if you try to download a petabyte of data over a cell phone connection, over 4G, it will take about 27 years to download all of that. And you know, I'm dating myself a little bit here, but if you take those old floppy disks, the five and a quarter inch, and try to stack them up on top of one another to have a petabyte worth of data capacity, that's going to be more than 12 Empire State Buildings. You know, it's like over 100 libraries of Congress, or every tweet ever recorded more than 50 times. So it sounds like a lot. But I'd like you to think about a petabyte of data slightly differently. If you are in the genomics field, well, petabyte of data is just about two micrograms of DNA if you try to sequence that DNA. Or from Google's standpoint, a petabyte of data is how much Google gets every day. That's the amount of video that Google gets uploaded into YouTube on a daily basis. And at this point, you can say, look, Carl, you know, I, I don't do genomics, or my company is not Google, so it's, it's not relevant to us. But I challenge you to think about petabytes of data in the following way. So think about uh, application servers or web servers. Many companies, many projects out there have hundreds of these servers. 200 servers is not a large number. And if you think about these application servers just general, generating log data, just logging maybe website visitors at 50 entries a second, if you don't have a petabyte of data now, in three years, with these 200 application servers, you'll have a petabyte of data to analyze. So the point is, even if vast majority of you are not analyzing petabytes of data today, you will soon. So what is that data? And I'm sure many of you know that uh, 
the studies have shown that 80 to 90 percent of that data, the data in the world, is unstructured data. But I think if you hear the BigQuery session, you probably have had some experience with SQL, with using BigQuery, and you're comfortable with structured data, the data that's organized into rows and columns, data with a relational schema, and that's what you want to analyze. So it seems like a challenge to think about all this unstructured data, all these images, uh, natural language text, videos, and think about how you can get value out of that data. Well, yes. It's, uh, it's impossible, really, to analyze unstructured data using SQL. But there's another very important category of data that I want to draw to, uh, your attention to, and that's semi-structured data. So if you want to think about semi-structured data, think about uh, data in a format like JSON or XML or even some key value databases. It's the data where you may have some relational schema. You can think about parts of JSON objects in terms of a schema that has strings or integers or dates. But at the same time, it has some data that doesn't really fit into a relational, traditional rows and columns format, right? Think arrays or things, think about uh, key value pairs or dictionaries in, um, uh, in JSON. So it seems like there's an interesting category in the middle between unstructured and structured data types. So it seems like th it might be interesting in some cases. Are there any practical examples of this kind of data? Well, I just wanted to mention this uh, recent announcement. This was announced back in May of this year. Uh, Twitter, the uh, uh, social networking company, actually decided to migrate their infrastructure over to Google Cloud. And think about the contents of these tweets. This is a perfect example of semi-structured data. Just look at the, uh, the tweet right here. It has natural language text, but at the same time, this kind of data contains embedded at mentions. This contains hyperlinks. And it also has some structured information with pointers to uh, graphic, it has dates, etc. So. This is a perfect example of a kind of data that exists in a semi-structured format that many companies may want to analyze. And now that Twitter is moving to Google Cloud, they'd be able to use Google Cloud capabilities like BigQuery to analyze this type of data. And if you're still skeptical, I just wanted to give you a few more concrete examples. Uh, in preparing for this talk, I actually went out and thought about the developer activity around semi-structured data. So the first place that I went to was uh, GitHub, the source code repository. And I went out and tried to analyze the GitHub commits or file changes to various structured and semi-structured data formats. So this is what I came up with. I actually looked at just the top five formats that you see listed on the slide. And if you're wondering why top five, it's because other formats like uh, DDLs, for SQL and others, actually were too, uh, resulted in too few commits to make a, make a significant bar on this, uh, on this chart. So this is one interesting data point. You can see over 100 million commits for JSON relative to about uh, 10 million for CSV, which is commonly used for structured data. And uh, at this point, you can say, so what? All right, so this is uh, GitHub commits. On one hand, GitHub is not really a data repository. And at the same time, developers often use JSON and XML as their configuration files, right? Something that they would change all the time. And that's fair. So I went out and looked at other sites for developers. The first one I looked at was Stack Overflow. And you'll notice a pattern, right? So the similar type of uh, uh, proportion exists. If you look at the semi-structured data formats like JSON and XML, they receive significantly more questions than CSV and various variants of SQL. So in this case, I actually looked at the questions for DDL formats as well. So that's just two data points. But if you go and look at other data sources, like uh, the uh, very well-known Hacker News social media website, uh, a similar pattern exists. In fact, I went out and looked at Google Trends, Google's own data repository, and there's roughly the same proportion. F if you compare the ac developer activity around structured and semi-structured data formats, about 80 to 90% of that activity happens around JSON, XML, YAML, the semi-structured data formats, as opposed to structured data formats that I lumped here together with CSV, 
TSV tab uh, separated format, SQL, DDL, and even Parquet and Evro. So the point is, there is something there. There's a valuable set of data that exists that developers are working with, but you need to ask yourself, are you getting insights out of this data? Clearly, it's important, this amount of data is growing, but what can you do about it? It seems like since it's semi-structured, traditional SQL is not really the right tool. And this is what I want to, uh, that's the point where I want to change your opinion in this session. So, uh, how many of you are first-timers to BigQuery? How many of you have never heard of BigQuery before today? Oh my God, I, this is the first time I think I'm seeing uh, single-digit hands uh, going up in this room. So looks like most of you know BigQuery. You know it's a petabyte scale data warehouse available from Google Cloud. It can get you results in seconds. And some of the reasons why it's so fast is it using this columnar-based storage format that behind the scenes is supported by a file system that automatically shards the data and makes it available to you as a BigQuery user at extremely high throughput rates with very low latency. And what you'll look at in the moment is the support for two types of data structures in BigQuery, known as arrays and structs. And what I'll show you is that both of these data types are part of SQL 2011 standard. So if you are already a SQL guru, but have not had a chance to work with these two types of uh, data structures, I think you'll find a lot of interesting uh, examples in this session. So one thing you need to know about BigQuery is that it consists of two parts. There's BigQuery storage, that is the data warehouse piece that maintains warehouses your data. And then there's the BigQuery analysis engine that takes your SQL statements and uses those SQL statements to analyze data. And what's great about BigQuery is that, first of all, it supports various types of data formats and data input sources. For example, you can get data into BigQuery from something like Google Analytics, Firebase, uh, other services on Google Cloud, like Cloud Data Store, and have that data reside inside of BigQuery storage. And another thing that's great about BigQuery is that it allows you to use the BigQuery analysis engine to run SQL statements against data that resides outside of BigQuery storage. So for example, you can use BigQuery to analyze data in something like uh, cloud storage buckets or in cloud Bigtable. And BigQuery is used by customers throughout the world. Uh, in fact, at this point, BigQuery supports exabytes of data for Google Cloud customers. Now, let's... Uh, Let's wrap up with the uh, uh, introductory part of the presentation and shift into something more technical. So what I'd like to do next is show you an example of analyzing semi-structured data with BigQuery. And uh, here's what I'll show you. Suppose I want to build an analysis engine to find out what do developers care about. Developers are early adopters. They sort of foresee trends. So what I'd like to be able to do is get data from the website known as Hacker News, the social media website, figure out what a developer is talking about, and then use that information to help me guide my decisions about uh, which technologies to learn. And before this session, I actually went out to Hacker News, and I used their APIs that happen to be JSON-based APIs, JavaScript object notation-based APIs, to download some sample data on my laptop. And what I'll do next is import that data into BigQuery uh, here on stage. Now, the way that I'll import this data is that I'll take this route shown on the screen with letter A. So imagine I have my JSON file, and I'll use the web UI that you see here to import this data into the BigQuery storage. Now, I can use the web UI. I can also use command line interface from BigQuery, known as BQ tool. I can even use BigQuery application programming interfaces, APIs to do that. Now, that's the approach that I'll take here during the demo. If you're planning to import data into BigQuery in production, please, I really ask you, please don't use this approach. And here's why. If you're trying to import data into BigQuery using this direct route, there are many things that can go wrong. One of them, you know, if you're using a browser, browsers have limitations on the sizes of files that you can upload. Browsers can crash. The network connections can get interrupted. 
So if you're thinking about importing data into BigQuery storage in production, what I'd like you to do is follow this route shown with letter B on the slide. So here's how it works. You're going to take a tool known as GSUtil. It's a command line utility. You will take your data and copy this data into something called Google Cloud Storage. And the great thing about this GSUtil tool is that it'll be a fault-tolerant upload for your data, meaning that GSUtil will actually resume data transfers if uh, there's a failure in the network connections. GSUtil will actually take checkpoints to make sure that it doesn't have to re-upload the entire data set. It only re-uploads the changes after the network connection. And one of the coolest things about GSUtil is that it supports multi-threaded uploading, which means that you can control how much bandwidth you may want to allocate to this GSUtil tool. And then after you moved your data via GSUtil into Google Cloud Storage, then your data is inside of Google Cloud, and you can use the rest of these tools that you see on the screen to get your data into BigQuery. All right, so that's enough with an overview. Let's switch over to the demo, and I'll show you how this works. So as, uh, as you can see right now, I'm looking at the BigQuery user interface. This lo should look very familiar to most of you. And notice that here I have my uh, BigQuery project with this long name, but the, we're going to call it a Quick Labs project. So to import data into this project, I need to create something called a data set. A data set is simply a container for the various data tables that I have inside of BigQuery. So I'm uploading Hacker News data. Let me just call it HN, short for Hacker News. I'm not going to specify the location for this data. I'll leave it unspecified. But if I wanted to, I could have set up data residency for this data set in the US, EU, or Tokyo. OK, so now I have this new data set. Let's actually go ahead and create a new table in this data set. So I'll click Create New Table. And after I close the editor on the right-hand side, you'll notice that on the right side of my screen, I have this option to create a table from source data. And as I pointed out moments ago, just for this demo, I'll upload a file into this table from my local file system. And this file is going to be a JSON document. If you're wondering what it looks like, remember, this is the data that I received from the Hacker News website via the APIs. So I cleaned it up a little bit. And if you look at the data here, you can see that's typical JSON object. So I have a date, and then I have these stories. And now this starts looking very different from most of uh, relational tables out there. Notice that I have a single date, and now within these stories, I have array of values. These are titles of articles, the number of times they have been upvoted, the score, the URL to these articles, and so forth. So this is what the data looks like. Let's go ahead and try to upload this into BigQuery. So I'm going to do a file upload. I'm going to choose my JSON document. And let's call this destination table as HN for Hacker News. And since this is from December 2008, I'll use 2008 as the suffix. Now, I could have specified the schema manually. But here, I'll trust BigQuery to figure out the schema of this JSON document automatically. Let's go ahead and click Create Table. And when I do this, BigQuery creates something known as a job. So in this case, the job happens to be to load the data inside of the BigQuery table. I can see that the job is complete. So let's actually take a look at this table. Let's preview the contents of this table. And uh, you know this should look familiar. Notice that I have a single row of data. Here's the URL to a story from Hacker News. Here's the score, the number of times that it has been upvoted, its title. And then there's the date. Now, if you've used traditional relational databases in the past, this should start to look weird. What happened to this date? I have all these values with the title, but now they're blanks for the date. Where did the date go? And notice that I have many of these titles for a single date. So how do I analyze this? Let's take a look at the schema. Maybe it has, has some hints. Well, this looks familiar. There's a date. It's nullable, so date is a standard SQL type. There are strings, integers. All of that looks familiar. But now there are these stories. And if you've never seen this before, records repeated, like, what are these? So I've been doing SQL for a while, but now I'm totally confused. So I don't know what to do. 
And at this point, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Evan, back on stage. He's going to give us a tool, the tools to better analyze this record-repeated strangeness in the schema. Cool. So uh, whenever you have any problems with nested and repeated fields, just call me. That's the, uh, that's the solution. End of demo. No, no I'm kidding. Uh, this, honestly, it blew me away. So I've been working with SQL for 10, 15 years. And even before I was smart enough, as Carl mentioned, to go into the schema and look for that, I was looking at the data. And the first thing, that, exactly as Carl mentioned, you have one row. And for me, being a structured data guy in the background as a data analyst, uh, scrolling over and seeing the date here and what I thought was null records, I kind of lost my mind. I'm like, oh, this is really, really weird. Even still, you have what you thought was one field, but it has a dot in it. Uh, you've got stories.title, you've got stories.score. So it almost looks like it's like two different tables in one. You've got dates and you've got articles and you have details all in one place. So that's, we're going to get into the magic as we work through some of these SQL queries that you're going to see. But the real exciting part about it for me personally, even if your data isn't in this format already, it could be. And that's the really, really fun part is because in a traditional relational database sense, normally you might have multiple different tables stored in multiple different places in a technical term that we called uh, normalization. And that's great for relational databases. But BigQuery doesn't operate that way. And you get a huge, huge potential performance boost uh, by bringing your data together, potentially in what I like to call a, a pre-joined or a nested, uh, nested way. So let's run through a bunch of queries. And I got some cool questions for you guys, too. Unfortunately, I wish I had like some swag or something like that to throw out in the crowd, but you'll just have to make do. So first and foremost, if you're familiar with SQL, you've probably seen a lot of like select star. And looking at some of these might be just a little bit baffling, but stick with it. So the first thing that we want to do is you can actually create array types. That's a nice booming voice. You can create array types directly in, in, in the SQL. So what I'm going to do, I'm still in the BigQuery web UI. If you didn't know it already, uh, if you actually highlight a portion of the query. I'm hitting uh, Command E on the, on the Mac, but you can actually execute just a partial statement of the SQL. So I've got a long SQL statement that I'm gonna walk through and execute each portion as you see. So I've got an array that I wanna create. As you saw in the image a little bit earlier, I have four different fruits that I wanna fill into my little array basket. So I'm saying this is gonna be an array. An array, again, is just gonna be um, a collection of those items that share a single, a singular data type. So that's the critical part, is that I'm saying, hey, everything that's gonna be in this collection is gonna be a string. So arrays have to share this single data type. That's gonna come back in one of the key points we, we talk about later. So as you saw in the results, again, if um, I haven't really worked a lot with, with arrays in BigQuery, this might look super strange. And the really cool part is if you hover over the type, you see, hey, not only is it a string in there, but it's repeated. So that's how you get your repeated data in there, where you have four what seemingly looks like four rows with one row here. So first time I saw that, I was like, OK. Uh, let's, see, let's see how far we can take this. All right, well, do I need to necessarily specify the string that you saw in brackets there earlier? No, I don't. BigQuery is smart enough to recognize that, hey, if you're passing in things that look like they're in string notation, sure, I'll interpret it as a, as a string for you. As you see here, it's still, still going to be a string. All right, well, what are some cool things that you can do once you have your, your data inside of arrays or you're accessing a data set that already has arrays? And by the way, the reason why we're creating these arrays, uh, normally if you had a field, you could just have the field name in here, but we just wanted to show you the special sauce with what's behind it. So we have, we're setting up our data set, and our data set is just literally going to be the array that you see here. It says, give me this array, an array of fruit, and with that fruit array, I'm going to select something. I'm going to go into the fruit array. Fruit array. I'm going to pull back the element in the second position. Anyone want to take a guess? Is it going to be a raspberry, a blackberry, a strawberry, or a cherry at position number two? <laughs> Everyone's just like, and when I get this huge, huge conference too, I'm like, eh, berry. <laughs> uh, strawberry is exactly correct. So if you work with arrays before, uh, you, can, you can get easily tripped up with like, all right, well, is it zero based or is it, is it one based as well? So you see zero for raspberry, blackberry, and then uh, blackberry's number one, strawberry's number two. That's because you're using offset. All right. If my aliases don't give it away. People in the audience are just like, I'm just reading his queries. Uh, you see that you can have it as ordinal, which is the same thing as offset, except you have ordinal starting with one. So one, two is now BlackBerry instead. So accessing array elements. This is like a fundamental part of like, okay, you got your data into an array format. How do you actually get it out of it? All right, what happens if you, if you did this? You only got four, four records in there. Well, it's going to look for the 999th in there. No, it didn't find it. It's out of bounds, overflow. The good news of BigQuery is you're not charged for queries that result in an error. And this is, this is 
a super friendly. I mean, I go to war with Invalidator on a daily basis, but honestly, it's your best friend because you can actually toggle it open and you can see uh, whether or not your query is going to execute with an error or without. So if you get that green, uh, that green check mark, you're in good shape. What other things can you do with arrays? You can do like cool array aggregation. So if you want to see how many elements are in the, in the array, it's just a simple function, array length. And you, the mind, your mind will begin to think of like, oh, what would I want to know? Like why was array, array length matters? Uh, for Carl's example I showed earlier, how many articles were published in a day? It's just the length of the array. Do mathematical operations. What happens if I wanted to do um, a little bit more uh, complex topics? Here's a big one. Exactly as Carl mentioned before, this is at the first point where I hit my first stumbling block in trying to really understand this. I have a field that's in array. I'm just hard coding this array right here, apple, uh, pear, and plum. And then I have a field that's not an array. So this is where it gets really interesting. So we've got repeated string, and then we've got all of these items in this array associated with this customer. But keep in mind, this is the, the massive kind of learning point, is that this is all in a singular row still. So this is what's called uh, an unflattened array. Let's see what happens when we flatten it. So in order to perform general SQL operations on this, we need to get things in, you know, into a one element per row context. And this is where the syntax starts to uh, get the better of some people, but it's not too bad. So let's see what we got. Now we're bringing back the items, the customer names, and then this is the magical command, is unnest. It flattens everything out. So while you had one row with three items before, we've essentially squished it with one, one row per each of the items in the array. And you're doing what's called a correlated cross join, which basically says, hey, remember when I had apple, pear, and peach, and just one Jacob? Just associate with that with each of the items in there. It's not like a, it is kind of like a traditional cross join, but it's not cross joining across all of your, all the different possible array values. It's just uh, cross joining it against just that one that it's associated with. And this is actually optional syntax. So if you ever see this in code, that's fine. Um, also, you can just have the comma there, and that works, because that's tr uh, treated as a cross join. So unnest is the critical part. And the reason why, here I like to think of unnest as, all right, well, unnest essentially breaks apart my array into one element on each, each separate row. But even more philosophically, you can think of this separate array that you're bringing in almost as like a separate table. And that's why you're unnesting this after the from statement. So typically in SQL you say, select a lot of stuff from a different table, join it on another table. That's the, kind of the, the, the simple uh, walkthrough for any data analyst. You're replacing that by saying, I have all of my data in this one table, but at different hierarchies. How do I get it on the same hierarchy? Well, instead of doing the joins between tables, you're now unnesting uh, within that singular table. Some of the cool things you can do, if you can imagine, you can find out what the order of the element in the array was. Super useful. And that's just simply by the reserve keyword offset. And here we just have the index of the, uh, each different items in there. So you can find do things like minimums, maximums, latest item that's in there as well. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. Carl and I have limited time to present all of the, uh, the cool things that you can do with nested and repeated fields. But there's two key takeaways. It's getting uh, your data into arrays is, is, is rather simple. And working with the syntax once it's in arrays, you're largely going to be working with unnest. So when you see unnest in, folk, in people's queries, all that means is it's taking elements into, into an array that's in a singular row, like five items in one row, and having five items be in five separate rows. So we can do array creation. This is saying, I have a data set that just has strings. We're going the other way now. So I have one, two, and a third row for banana. Now we're going the reverse. We're packing all those into an array. And you can't do arrays of arrays. But I'm going to show you something just in a minute that has a really cool container aspect of it. Same query as before, but if you wanted to do a nice order, let's see if we can't get apple, banana, pear. And you can, there you go. Honestly, it's much like you would treat another different table in there as well. Same order by works. All right, a little bit more complex. What happens if I wanted to do just a filter? I want to filter only to include items uh, that I want from one of those particular rows. And here, here's where it gets really interesting. So if you had something like this, which is what we're going to repeat in the next query, to get at, say I want to return just the customers that have apples in their fruit basket. Um, I first need to access that array. Remember, accessing the arrays involves flattening them, squishing them into different one row per each different element in the array. So we need to first do that. So at the first, you'll see, all right, well, this is our global list. 
let's unnest that, flatten that, and then we can just operate over just like normal, because row one is apple, row two is banana, row three is pear. We can just filter that just like a normal SQL query, and then we can combine it back into an array format at the outset. So it's going into the array, it's squishing it so we can operate over it, and then it's putting it all back together in an array. And you can see in the query results here, this returns all of the, uh, the customers, in this particular case, the customers' back baskets that had uh, Apple in it. Notice that the third row or the third array returns a null or an empty set. So keep that in mind when you're working with arrays is that if the condition doesn't match, in like tr tr your traditional joins, you might not get a record return, but you'll get an empty set, a null set. Okay. So that is arrays. That's half of what I call the magic. So if you understand arrays and unnesting, that's 90% of the hard leg work. And a lot, honestly, it's, it, it took me you know, a, a decent couple of weeks to really wrap my head around the unnesting syntax, but philosophically think about it as a separate table. Now, Carl also mentioned a really, really cool other native SQL 2011 syntax uh, data type that's supported by BigQuery, and that's the struct or structure. Think of it like a container. So this is where it gets really interesting. You have one field, we're specifying that it can, unlike an array, it can contain different data types within one field. So we're going to say it's an integer for the first field, and it's a string for the second field. And we're saying 35 for uh, this field. We're not giving it a name yet. And we're saying a string of Jacob for the second one. Any thoughts what's, what's missing here? What looks, fun, what looks funny about this? There's two things that are missing. Any thoughts? Yeah, the names. So we have, we're missing not only the name of the field, Let's execute this. If I just ran that piece. Okay, so I'm specifying this as 35 is gonna be the age, Jacob is gonna be the name, but also, since this is a collection, right, it's a collection of these fields, you need to give the overall container a name. And this is the foundation of the nested and repeated fields, where now I'm storing something where I have multiple fields associated with a, a single uh, piece of information, in this particular case, customers, where I'm storing multiple data points. Why is this useful? If you're thinking in the back of your head, that looks just like a table that I'm bringing in. Customers.age, customers.name, imagine having other structs in here storing things like uh, items that are in their shopping carts or transaction history. Instead of having a massive schema with 15 different things like you do in the transactional world, you bring that all together into one massive reporting table through the use of structs. Now here's where it gets really interesting. Of course, you're already familiar with arrays. You can have arrays inside of these containers as well. So now we're slowly building together our, our grocery, uh, grocery example here. We now have what you saw before, the age and then the name, and then we're also hard coding an array data type in there. So you saw this before, a repeated string, but now it's part of a collection of customers in there as well. Now you can go the opposite direction as well you can actually have an array of struct uh, data types. So the combination of using arrays and structs is super powerful. The two key points that I'll leave you with are, one, if you see um, a schema that looks, that looks like this, here, let me pull it up. As Carl uh, showed before, actually I'll just jump into Hacker News. So. This is the Google Analytics schema. So Google dog foods its own schemas uh, in the sense of if we're telling you guys this is a great way to store highly performant data, um, you know, you're going to see that out in the wild. So if you have Google Analytics data, exactly as Carl was showing you before, if you're looking through your schema and you say, okay, integer, 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 whoa, what is this record here? That is a struct. It's a collection. And you see it's a totals collection. So much like where you might ha have had a separate table for session details about the visitor and then session details about the, the totals for the visitor, this is all now within the same table. And the, reason, the easiest way you can find that is look for data types that have records. And I'll show you just as a fun example, you can have pretty wide schemas now. So there's, I don't know if you can see that, there's 32 different structs that are available within even just the Google Analy Analytics schema. And where it gets really interesting if you take this the, you know, even further, you can have structs inside of structs. 
So for Google Analytics, how it stores the data is global information about the hits data at that one level. But what about particular pages? OK, sure. Hits that page, that page pass. You can go almost you know, like Inception a couple layers deep there as well. So again, this is just kind of stretch, uh, scratching the surface with what we can do with the, with the time allotted. But it's a super fun concept. Even if you have your existing data, consider working with getting it into arrays and structs to see if there's a performance impact. If you're doing a lot of joins between your transactional data to get it into one place, perhaps store it on the reporting uh, data table side into a nested and repeated format and see instead of doing those potentially expensive SQL uh, uh, joins on, the, on your queries to see if you can't get more performance benefit from doing uh, nested and repeated. Uh, also, uh, as a side plug, we're doing a full day boot camp uh, to, on Friday, eight hours. Uh, so if you wanted to get more experience working with BigQuery, or working with data pipelines and data flows, and we have a new lab on the BigQuery machine learning, which was at the keynote a little bit earlier today, uh, you're welcome to, to show that as well. But we are going to close this uh, session. Carl's going to come on back up and show you actually how we take our Hacker News data that we ingested a little bit earlier and work with that in this format. All right. Thanks, Evan. Evan, I really appreciate it because now I feel, even though I'm just a program manager, that I can do really cool stuff with, um, uh, with BigQuery, with nested and repeated fields. So let me just uh, make sure that I cover some of the key takeaways from what Evan said. And Evan can keep me honest here. So the first thing to remember about arrays in BigQuery, there are these lists that can have zero or many values, right? They're ordered lists of items. but all the values in the array must have the same data type. You can have arrays of integers, strings, and so on, right? Very important. And the other point that you need to remember, here, when you're talking about the arrays, these are SQL 2011 arrays, standard arrays. All right, so that was arrays. Let's move forward and talk about the structs. So what are structs? So structs can have many different data types. You can have structs with integers, structs with strings. You can even have structs with arrays, right? Remember, you cannot have arrays inside of arrays, but you can have arrays inside of structs. And if you're wondering about the connection here to the SQL 2011 standards, these structs are SQL 2011 structured types. All right. So. I hope this makes sense to Evan so far. I think it makes sense to me. And this is where I had my, what I call an inception style moment when I understood these nested and repeated fields in BigQuery. They're just arrays containing structs that may have arrays inside of them with other structs, with other structs, and arrays and so forth. So it, as it's called sometimes, it's turtles all the way down. Okay. So that was the key takeaway. We have these structs and arrays. Now, let's think about what this means in context of this Hacker News data set. Remember, I started this presentation talking about JSON data that looks kind of like this. So now let's think about it from the standpoint of what was imported into BigQuery and how BigQuery actually recognized this data and created the schema. So here's my Hacker News uh, table, and now, I know from Evan that repeated simply means an array. And record is just a struct. So here I have an array of structs that maintains these stories. And at this point, I feel confident from uh, Evan's uh, training on these structs and arrays. So I'm going to attempt something extremely risky. I'm actually going to do some live coding right here on stage. Live demo, live coding here on stage to try to analyze this data and try to get some awesome results. Because here's what I'd like to be able to do. Remember, with this um, Hacker News data, I'd like to be able to go to a particular day from Hacker News. And let's say I want to pick the top five most highly upvoted articles. And if you're wondering uh, why top five or top two as shown on the screen, basically here you're seeing only the top two articles for each day because that's how many I could fit in the slide. All right, so that's, that's what I want to get. I want to have rows with dates and then for each day, two stories. So let's go back to my uh, BigQuery UI. I'm going to query this table but the first thing that I'll do, and actually I recommend that all of you do the same, is switch over to something known as a standard SQL dialect. So I'll disable legacy SQL, and I'll use standard SQL for my analysis. So now let me go ahead and query the stable, and here's a prepared 
uh, SQL query that I'm going to use. So a few things to notice here. What's going on in this query? This first part of the from statement is my project ID. The HN is my data set, where I have the table HN 2008 with my uh, Hacker News Stories data. So just to make sure that this works, let me go ahead and just pull in the dates from that, um, from that data set, execute the query, and see what comes up. And just as I expected, I simply have a list of these dates. So these happen to be all the dates from December of 2008. So pretty straightforward. Now, what I want to be able to do is that for each day, each date from my data set, I want to have two top scoring articles. So this means I'll have multiple records for each day. And what does this mean? This means I need to create an array. So let's go ahead and say I want to create an array. And to do that, I'll type in array. And where is the data for this array going to come from? That's the important question. Well, if I check my, my schema, what I want to have inside of this array are the story scores and the story titles. Okay? So the first thing that I need to do, since I know it's an array of uh, structs, Right? Repeated means array, record means a struct. Let's unnest, unnest that uh, array. So let's unnest stories. And that's where the data is going to come from. So I'm going to use the keyword from, from unnest stories. And what do I select from there? Well, since it's a struct inside of those stories, let's do a select as struct. And what I'd like to get are the story scores. So let's do a score and the title. OK? And what I'd like to do is to give a name to this array. So let's just call it stories. So the entire array of my top scoring articles is going to be called stories. And this looks, looks pretty good. But remember, on my slide, it could only fit two, top two. So let's add limit two, so I can only look at uh, the top two articles for each day. And let's go ahead and do an order by, because I want to know all the top scoring articles for each day. So I'll do an order by score in the descending order. So I'll open up my editor. I'll select this to run it, do a quick sanity check. If anybody thinks this is broken, Evan, keep me honest here. So let's, let's let it run. All right, so it's running. And bam, there it is. So that's exactly what I expected from my slide. I have each day in December of 2008, for each day, I have two top scoring articles. And now I can start doing cool stuff with this. I can put this data into uh, machine learning APIs from uh, Google Cloud, try to analyze sentiment. I can use this data to extract out most common topics, whatever the uh, people of Hacker News were discussing that day. And uh, this, the most important thing is that it gets me started with analyzing this kind of semi-structured data. So let's, uh, let's recap. What I want you guys to think about is what we said in the beginning about semi-structured data. You're never going to have as much uh, data in the semi-structured or structured camp as uh, our colleagues who are working with images, videos, sound, and so on. But now, think about all the semi-structured data that you have within your company or maybe on your project. You're probably paying for that data. You're storing it somewhere. But are you getting insights out of that data? Are you getting value from that data? If not, I want you to think about using BigQuery to analyze that data and use standard SQL 2011 structs and arrays to help you with that analysis. And hopefully, you know, you guys now are excited to broaden your skill set with SQL and actually start doing this. So if you are interested, I, I want to reiterate what uh, Evan said a little bit earlier. We have a one-day boot camp that focuses on taking marketing data Analy Google Analytics data that uses structs and repeated fields. And throughout this Marketing uh, Analytics Day boot camp that we have on Friday starting at 9 a.m., you'll spend a day basically analyzing data and getting some value out of this Marketing Analytics data for, uh, for your own project. So that's going to be at 9 a.m. in Moscone South. And uh, if you haven't seen this uh, link yet, and if you're interested in learning more about uh, uh, doing this kind of analysis with BigQuery, I encourage you to sign up uh, for this uh, Coursera promotion. If you go to coursera.org slash next18, you can actually get one month free subscription to use various on-demand Coursera classes from Google Cloud that include topics like how Google does machine learning. They include topics on using BigQuery for analysis and uh, also many other topics like cloud architecture. 
And then I'll just leave these links here. You can go to Google search and search for things like BigQuery Quick Labs or BigQuery Public Datasets if you'd like to learn more.